Hi, I'm Tim Brewster, senior pastor of First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. We welcome, welcome you to, to service this service of worship. Of worship. I'm glad you've chosen to join us in this broadcast of our 11 o'clock worship service. And I hope you can join us in person at one of our services at 8.30 in the chapel, 9.30 in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary, and at 11.11 in Wesley Hall. On behalf of the whole congregation of First United Methodist Church, I welcome you. Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Sign up for the fall Bible studies and spiritual growth. This is the last day to register. And also on this coming Friday in Wesley Hall is the coffee house presenting Carrie Newcomer. Please review all of the announcements that are in the bulletin and be prepared to choose the ones that will be helpful to you. Let us now begin our worship. If you will please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
As we honor the miracle of birth, let us prepare our hearts as the Johnson family brings their daughter for holy baptism. Baptism is a sign to us of the mercy and grace of God, indicating that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of anything that we ourselves do, but simply upon the basis of God's gracious initiative toward us. It is also a sign that we as a congregation and you as family and parents commit yourselves to raise this child under the guidance of the church until she will make the decision of faith for herself. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, let the children come unto me, do not forbid them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Hannah Elizabeth in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Mm -hmm. Hannah Elizabeth, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now if you'll place your hands on her. Hannah, Elizabeth, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, this is Hannah Elizabeth, the newest member of the household of faith. And we, along with her parents, pledge ourselves to help nurture her in the Christian faith, so that as she grows up among us, she will come to the place in her own life where she will stand at this or some other altar and make her own profession of faith in Christ. All, all this is God's wondrous gift that's offered to us without price. With God's help, we will, we will so, so order, order our, our lives after, after the, the example, example of Christ, Christ that Hannah and Elizabeth, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established. boys and girls to come down to our usual spot for our time together and I see some new faces in the crowd if you want to come down but you're a little nervous you can bring a grown-up with you that's okay come on down
If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. Good. I just wanted to make sure you were paying attention. And paying attention is going to be the theme for this morning. I'm going to tell you three very short stories about paying attention. And the first one, well, I can't say the first one. I have to start. How do we always start a story? With once upon... Well, you start the story and I'll finish it. Start it. Once upon a time... That's a very good beginning. It's very promising. We're off to a good start. All right. Once upon a time, there was a man named Moses. Have you ever heard of Moses? Yeah, yeah. he had the hat. He had the Viking hat? Well, that, well, that's a different version than I'm familiar with, but I'll take your word for it. Well, Moses was working as a shepherd, and God called him. And God didn't use a telephone, and God didn't use email. There wasn't email back then. I know that's really hard to believe. But back then, God called him with a burning bush. Say what? The bush was on fire. And Moses went to go look at the bush, and the bush was on fire. But you know what? Here's the neat thing about it. The bush didn't burn up. Have you ever seen that? That doesn't ever happen. When something's on fire, it burns down, doesn't it? Yeah. Or like a, have you ever had a marshmallow that you had in the fire too long, and it got so toasty, and it just went and dripped, and bye-bye s'mores? Well, this happened to the bush, but the bush did not burn down. Was that funny? Did you like that sound effect? All right. You like that? All right. Well, I'll do it for you later. All right. But now, back to our story. So anyway, the bush was burning. But you know why God spoke to Moses from the burning bush? Not because the bush was on fire, but because Moses noticed it. Think about how many people probably walked by that burning bush and didn't think anything of it. It's a dry climate. The bush was on fire. No big deal. But Moses saw something different. Shh, 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 shh. But Moses saw something different about that burning bush. And he went and listened, and he heard the voice of God, and you know what God said? I'm going to tell you, but you've got to lean in real close. You've got to lean in closer. He said, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses didn't want to at first, but he did, because you've got to listen to God. Now, you're ready for the second story? And the story goes like this. It starts with, once upon a time, there was a guy named Mark. That's me. Okay? Don't laugh. This is a serious story. All right. And Mark really wanted to do this for a living. I'm going to give you a hint. I'll give you another hint. Leap of all to Kenneth's Harlish's Kent. Oh, he wanted to be an opera singer. Oh, he wanted to be an opera singer so bad. I look like a cow. I kind of sound like one, too, don't I? Well, well, my parents, my parents thought it'd be a really good idea if I went ahead and got a degree in music education, so in case my opera career didn't work out, I could still go and teach music, which was really smart on their part, and that's what I did. But I didn't want to go teach music. I wanted to be an opera singer, but I had to go sit in a classroom with an elementary music teacher after I'd done all of my classes and observe her teach music class. And that's where I heard the voice of God for the first time. And it wasn't with a burning bush or a telephone. It was with this. What do you think this is? Lipstick. It's lipstick. And you're thinking, okay, Mr. Mark, I don't get it. How does lipstick, how did you hear the voice of God with lipstick? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to put it on. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> My mentor, the teacher there, her name was Mrs. Johnson, and she, when I got there, she'd been in the same room for 34 years, and in those 34 years, she had taken nine sick days. I don't know how she did it. That means for 25 years at least, she had perfect attendance, and here's the deal. I had it in my head. I was going to be an opera singer. I was going to be big. I was going to be famous. I was going to be on the great stages of the world. And I didn't think of a music classroom as being anything all that special, where anything heroic could happen. And, but every, after every class, she would put on a fresh coat of lipstick, dab it on her tissue, and the next class would come in. And I would see her put the, the lipstick on. Okay, another class would leave. She'd put a little bit more lipstick on and dab it. And I thought about that because I kept seeing it come out. And I said, Miss Johnson, why, why do you keep putting on the, lip, say, on the lipstick? And she said, because, Mark. Every class deserves to see the same fresh face, Mrs. Johnson, that the first class got to see. And I thought, wow. 
and it kind of opened my eyes, and I thought, this is a great place to be. There is something heroic about this, and Mrs. Johnson felt like she had a very important job to do, and that made me change my mind about what it was like to be with kids and teach music, and I decided to put down my hat that made me look like a cow, and you're the one that told me that. I remember. I was there. And so that's when I decided to be a music teacher. And it's because I listened to the voice of God. Now, I didn't hear any voices say, Mark, it's time to be a music teacher. It was something I felt down deep in my heart that being a music teacher was right. It was the right thing to do. And I knew right there. Now, I've got one more story for you. It's a real quick one. And you have to start it. Once upon a time, there was a wonderful group of little boys and little girls that paid attention and they heard the voice of God. And you know what that voice said? You know what that voice said? You're going to have to tell me. You have to finish that story. That's your story. Was that a boring story? All right. Let's close with a prayer. Close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God, I'm listening. I'm listening. Amen. Amen. See you next time. Tell me how your story turns out. Bye-bye. KK, get some sleep. Now there are a variety of gifts, and there are varieties of services, and there are varieties of activities, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit, for just as the body is one and has many members, so it is with Christ. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, stand as we affirm our faith to one another. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
We give you thanks, O oh God, for hands that labor, labors both seen and unseen. The hand that has held a bicycle seat while a child unknown to themselves rides on their own. A hand that places a cold cloth on a feverish brow. A hand that holds a fabric waist belt, helping a stroke victim, victim take wobbly steps for the first time. Hands that pick fruits and vegetables on behalf of others so that we may eat. Hands held with one another in prayer. The hands of a surgeon who removes a cancerous tumor. The hand of a teacher who gives a student guidance for writing the letter A for the first time. The hand that welcomes a stranger. The hands of those married 50 years locked in an embrace. The hands of a father giving a daughter in marriage. The hands of a parent holding the hand as a child crosses the street for the first time for the first day of school. The hand that embraces a child going off to war. A hand that clasps a loved one for the last time as they are being laid to rest. You know, O oh God, the hands of those who labor, seen and unseen. The hands of those holding chainsaws and shovels as they seek to rebuild from a devastating storm. For all hands, O oh God, which reach out to help, we are before you with grateful hearts and in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Hear anew this wonderful story from the third chapter of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And then he said, Here I am. Then God said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, 
to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of our ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. As many of you have uh, seen on the news, Hurricane Gustav is headed toward Louisiana and the Texas coast, and I wanted to uh, make a, just a brief announcement about that. 
Uh, they have, as you know, already begun to evacuate uh, those areas where Gustav is expected to make landfall. And Fort Worth is one of many cities who will be hosting uh, evacuees because of this hurricane. And the main shelter will be overseen by FEMA and the city of Fort Worth. But there will be other shelters. And we are number one, our church is, number one on the, uh, for, uh, on the list of backup shelters uh, to shelter evacuees. And so uh, we will likely be opening a shelter here at the church that will be supported by the city of of Fort Worth and by, um, uh, by FEMA as well with um, some of the assets that we'll need to do a good job of that. Uh, but we don't know yet whether that will happen or not. I wanted to make you aware, however, that that is likely and uh, we will open our shelter in the Justin building. And uh, many of you I know will wanna know how can I help, uh, what, what can I do? And of course we all wanna be in prayer uh, for these people who will be coming our way uh, who are having to leave their homes and are fearful about what might will happen. We want to pray for all those who will be affected uh, and for the volunteers and those who uh, work for the city and for FEMA and for other organizations. Uh, we'll also be needing volunteers, of course. We'll be needing uh, some funding for that. Uh, and so when we get word from the city of Fort Worth, immediately an email will go out to the whole congregation to let you know what the needs are and how we can participate uh, in that. Uh, it may be helping with food or items we need in the shelter. We're gonna reinstate our hurricane relief fund uh, so that you'll be able to give uh, to that and that may be the best way uh, to support the efforts because then exactly what is needed will be uh, purchased but we'll try to be very detailed with the list that will go out as well. So I wanted to make you aware of that and, and I'd like for us to just Bow our heads for a moment of prayer as we uh, pray for, for those who will be affected in this way. Our gracious, loving God, we unite our hearts in prayer for those whose homes are in danger, whose lives are in danger. We pray for each one, for your peace and for your strength, for all those who will be helping to protect property and lives, and for those who will be helping to evacuate those who need to uh, get out of uh, harm's way. For all of these, we pray for those who reach out as volunteers and as paid workers to help in all these ways. We ask your blessing and your peace and strength for each one. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I want to uh, just take a personal moment um, to introduce to you my mother. Uh, my mother is, would you mind standing, mother? And and I know that's not fair because you don't get to introduce your mothers when they when they visit like that. But uh, it's been a while because of the uh, you know the long illness of my uh, stepfather. My mother was not able to worship here for a long time, and it's probably been two and a half years, I guess, since you've been able to. Be here. And so what a joy it is to have her here. And we're celebrating her birthday this weekend as well. So uh, glad you're here. Um, I want us to uh, think about this Old Testament. It said New Testament in the bulletin, but really we do know the difference between the two Testaments. Uh, this is a lesson from the Hebrew Scriptures. And uh, it is the well-known account of the call of Moses. Moses had left Egypt for fear of his life because he was a Hebrew. He was raised as an Egyptian. And uh, one day when he saw an Egyptian taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave, he became angry. He lost his temper and he killed the Egyptian taskmaster. And he knew that his life would be short in Egypt. And so he left for fear of his life. Wound up as a shepherd in Midian keeping watch over the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro. And now at the age of 80, Moses is watching over the sheep, doing what he did every day, taking care of business as usual. And he had this remarkable encounter. He saw a bush that was burning but was not consumed. And he went closer to get a look at this strange sight. And when he 
drew near to the burning bush, he heard a voice. And the voice said, Moses, Moses. And Moses responded, here I am. And the voice said, take off your shoes, Moses. You are on holy ground. I want us to think a little bit this morning about holy ground. Moses suddenly, in the midst of his everyday life, suddenly found himself standing on something called holy ground. Now you know that the word holy means simply different, other than, set apart for a special purpose. And so when we talk about a holy book, the Bible, it is different than any other book. It's set apart for a special purpose. The holy sanctuary is a room that's different from another room. It's holy. It's set apart for a particular purpose. You see? And so here's Moses standing on ground that the voice, and we will learn whose voice it is as the story goes on. It's the voice of, of the God of Moses' ancestors. It's the voice of the God of promise. It's the voice of one who only identifies himself as I am. I am who I am. And that voice says, take off your shoes, Moses, your own holy ground. I was thinking this week about this idea of removing his shoes. Why did God want Moses to take his shoes off? Well, Maybe it was so that nothing would stand between Moses and the ground that's different from any other ground, the ground that's there for a special purpose. It's holy ground. And so nothing must come between Moses and that ground. Take your shoes off, Moses, so that you are touching this ground. But it occurred to me there may be another reason. Maybe the reason Moses was to take his shoes off was so he wouldn't run. <laughs> After all, he must have been at least uncomfortable. He had things to do. He had places to go. He had sheep to tend. Take off your shoes, Moses, on this rough, rocky ground here in Midian, not because you need to be comfortable, but because you need to be uncomfortable. So you will stand here, so you will stay here, and you will wrestle with what is going on in your life right now. This is ground that's different from any other ground. This is ground set apart for a special purpose. Stand here, Moses. Take your shoes off. And Moses takes his shoes off. And then there ensues this question and answer period, this time of struggling as God calls Moses and challenges Moses and Moses answers and resists and argues and tries to put it off on someone else. Now if you haven't been able to identify with Moses yet, Think about the arguing with God. I mean, I, I, I think right now of a man who I know argues with God when a call comes. I saw him just this morning. I rounded the corner, and there he was looking at me in the mirror. Do you know that person? Who, when you know what God wants you to do, you say, well, I'm really not. Who am I? I'm only one person. That's the first thing Moses said to God. Who am I? One person. Who am I that you would ask me to do such a thing as to go and set your people free from slavery in Egypt, the place that I ran from and should never enter again? What do you mean, me of all people? And Moses says, and besides, who are you? How can I be sure that you are who you say you are? I need a name. When I go back and try to convince them, I need to know who I'm convincing. And I'm not equipped. And besides, Moses goes on to say, 
He is slow of speech and tongue. He doesn't speak well. Which is kind of hard to believe because Moses has been pretty good at arguing with God up until this time. But he says, I don't speak well. And then I love this part. He, and this isn't in our text for today, it's later on, but he finally says, do you know my brother Aaron? Send him. I like that. Here I am, Lord, send him. <laughs> and that's often what happens on this ground called holy ground. It is a place in our lives that's unlike any other place. And I truly believe that every person stands on holy ground. At one time or another, at many times as a matter of fact in our lives, we stand at a place that's different than any other place and that has its special purpose in our lives at that moment. It is holy ground. And God has an interesting variety of ways to get our attention. Moses had this burning bush. That's a pretty interesting way to get his attention as a shepherd in Midian. But what about you and me? A few weeks ago, I talked to a couple, and they told me a story that I have heard in various forms many, many times. A young couple. They became a part of this congregation. And they had not been in church for a long time. Young parents. And they told the story of how they grew up in the church, at least moderately active in the church, when they went away to college, they grew distant from the church and their faith grew cold. And they got married and, and just things kind of went along, business as usual. And then, and then they had a baby. And when they held their baby in their arms for the first time and they looked at that baby, they knew that they were standing on ground that they had never stood on before. It was different from any other ground and it was there for a special purpose as they stood in that place and they looked at that child and they heard their names called and they must have asked variations of the question, who, us? What responsibility this is. What an awesome task we have. And they recognized their need for God in their lives. And they knew something was missing and they knew that it would be their responsibility to pass that on to this child. And so they began to search for a place where they could become a part of a faith community to be supported in the difficult task of parenting to make friends who can be there for them in the good times and the, and the, and the dark times of life and, and to connect with God again in their lives and to have a place where this baby can grow up nurtured in the Christian faith. They were standing on holy ground. Joe Fender wrote an account of going about his business one evening, living a wonderful life with his wife Cindy and their three children. Everything's going fine. They live in a beautiful home. Job's good. Everything's just great. And his little daughter, six-year-old Chelsea, comes to him and says, Look, Daddy, what I did. And presented to him uh, a picture. And he said, Tell me about the picture. And she said, Well, uh, that, there's baby brother right there. And he's crying. You know, and, and here's Quinn. That's the... the next one up. He's two years old. Here's Quinn, and, and he just hit baby brother, and, and here's mama. She's in the kitchen cooking dinner, and here I am reading, uh, reading a book, and there you are. And he said, he looked at the picture of himself, and he said to his daughter, Chelsea, why is my face all colored in? She said, oh, daddy, that's not your face. That's the back of your head. You're sitting at your computer working. And you know, all of a sudden, it was like for him a burning bush. All of a sudden, he is standing on ground that's different from any other ground. It became holy ground in that moment. And he had a vision, he said. And the vision was Chelsea as an adult having no memory of me, but that I worked all the time. And in that moment, 
he received a call to pay attention to what was most important in his life and what is his primary covenant to be husband and father in that family. It was holy ground for him. I think about a woman in our congregation. Her name was Esther Hamill. She was an elderly woman and uh, had been ill most of her life, had had uh, debilitating illness. She was a wonderful lady. She was bedridden completely. She was in bed all the time. She was blind, legally blind. She had just a little bit of eyesight. She had a device that enabled her to write. Uh, it was a kind of sliding ruler sort of device. And she spent her days writing letters of encouragement to people and letters of welcome to new members of the church. See, she went about her business every day simply lying in the bed. And at some point, it became, that place became for her a place unlike any other place. She was on holy ground and she heard the call of God to do what she could do in her situation with what she had. And she had a great ministry of praying for people and writing letters of encouragement to others. And when we held her memorial service, we remembered the power of her ministry. I think about the nine-year-old boy who came to me one day with uh, over a hundred dollars that he had gotten together from his lemonade stand that he had run all summer. And he was saving up money to buy a bicycle. But as he was serving lemonade early in the summer, sitting in that stand, all of a sudden, I don't know what got his attention, but suddenly it became holy ground for him. And he heard God calling him. He just felt God drawing him to give half of what he earned in the lemonade stand for the homeless. And so he presented that gift, proud of it. Oh, if God loves a cheerful giver, God was in love with that nine-year-old boy. Holy ground. He had he'd been standing on holy ground. Holy ground can be a tough place to stand. You've heard these stories. Moses took off his shoes and he was standing on that rocky ground. It can be difficult because it can be a place where we struggle mightily with what God is calling us to do and what we may want to do instead. Or we are come face to face with who God has called us to be and created us to be and who we have been being. And when we come to that place in our lives, we're standing on holy ground. It is a place where God calls us to a calling. I love what Fre Frederick Buechner says about call, about God's call in our lives, about calling or about vocation, which is more than just occupation. It includes that, but it's more than that. It's what we do with our whole lives, and it's who God called us to be. He said that vocation or calling is when our deep gladness intersects with the world's deep need. Let me say that again. It's when our deep gladness intercepts or intersects with the world's deep need. That's calling. That, in fact, is holy ground. Our deep gladness comes from being who God calls us to be and created us to be. That's our deep gladness, who God created us to be. When we're being who God created us to be, there is this depth of joy and gladness, what Jesus called abundant life. There's an old Hasidic tale that I love. There was a Hasidic teacher named Zuzia. Zuzia one day came to his disciples and he was clearly shaken. He seemed to be upset about something. His disciples said, Zuzia, what's the matter? And he said, I had a vision where the angels asked me the question that I will hear on the last day. Well, Zuzia, you've lived, 
You've lived such a pious life. Why does that concern you at all? And he said, because the question was not, why were you not Moses who led his people out of slavery? The question was not, why were you not Joshua who led the people into the promised land? Zuzia said, the question was, why were you not Zuzia who I created you to be? See, our deep gladness comes when we are who God created us to be. And that, inter- that call comes when it intersects with the world's great need. And so for that nine-year-old boy, living life, enjoying life, created to be the kid that wants the bicycle, and running the lemonade stand in the summertime, and that comes up against this great need for helping a homeless person and his call was received right then. Think about the people who go on mission trips, our youth who came and shared with us in worship service that they led a few weeks ago. What did they talk about? They talked about holy ground where their deep joy, their deep gladness met the world's deep need. And that's call. Holy ground is the place where God calls us and the place where God assures us in spite of our arguments that God will give us what we need. That's what he did with Moses. And that we will not be alone. That's also what he did with Moses. Holy ground is the place where we become convinced to go from that place a new person with a new call and a new commitment. Perhaps you're standing on holy ground in your life right now. Perhaps God is calling you to a new start, a new beginning, a new life. Perhaps God is calling you to do something that you never thought would be possible or that you've been resisting for a long time. Are you standing on holy ground? Let's pray. Our gracious, loving God, open our eyes that we might see when we are on holy ground a different place in our life, a special place there for a special purpose. Oh God, enable us to take off our shoes so that we might feel the ground on which we stand, that we might experience it even in its discomfort so that we might spur, be spurred on from that place when the time is right, but so that we might stand long enough to look at our lives, to experience our deep gladness of being who you created us to be and to experience the world's deep need that we might hear your call in that holy place. It's in the name of Jesus we ask this.
God, as we gather here in this holy place, on this holy ground, we ask your blessings on these offerings that we have made and ask that you be with us. Amen. If this is the day that you've decided to make this your church home, if you will come forward during the singing of this hymn of invitation and meet Dr. Brewster here, verses 1 and 2. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen. <laughs>